All right, so I make it just gone um, 11, and so I'm going to make a start, and as people emerge, they can continue to emerge. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Um, my name is Gabriel Cantor-Weber. I am a trainee rabbi at Leo Beck College in London. Um, every year for the past few years at Limud, I've been giving that introduction. This is the last year, hopefully, I'll be giving that introduction because next year I will be a rabbi at Brighton and Hove Progressive Synagogue down on the South Coast. But the final hurdle that every Leo Beck student has to pass in order to reach that moment is to write a dissertation of 20,000 words on a topic more or less completely of one's choice. And I decided to dive in and horrify my superiors with um, looking at the concept of bad rabbis, um, of whom there have been some, and particularly at the concept of whether there is an idea of defrocking in Judaism. And this is surprisingly more topical than you might think. The Church of England, as we speak, is in the process of introducing a process of defrocking. At the moment, that can't happen to priests, but the child abuse inquiry, which has been going on, again, for those not in the UK, there's been a very big in ongoing inquiry into child abuse in religious institutions. And they gave a very strong recommendation that there should be a defrocking process for priests. So that is being introduced um, as we speak. But I decided to look at the parallel question for rabbis, which is in some ways much more difficult, because unlike the Church of England, we can't just introduce a rule. That's not really a thing that Jews do in quite the same way. So I'm going to take you through some of the research that I found. And the disclaimer to that is this is unfinished research. And please pop things in the chat that you think are going to be useful, as well as you think are going to be questions, because I've still got um, a few months in which to finish this work and to hand it in. And so this is an ongoing project. So I'm actually going to start with someone who's not a rabbi, but is bad. Here is their photo. If anyone happens to recognize this person, pop in the chat. There's no reason why you would really, but they had a brief spell on the front pages in about 2017. Seeing if anyone's gonna be bold enough to get, venture a guess. So this is a man called Simon Brammel. And Simon Brammel was a surgeon at an NHS hospital in Birmingham until it was discovered that he had the charming habit of irradiating his initials into the internal organs of patients on whom he was operating. Um, this was only discovered when one of his patients needed a second operation by a different surgeon who opened them up and noticed that their liver had the letters SB on it. And they thought, hang on a minute, that, that can't be right. Creepy, exactly. Every, I mean, everyone needs a hobby, but also clearly unacceptable. And he was prosecuted for assault and fined for assault. But in terms of his medical license, that didn't make a difference because he got a fine. He wasn't imprisoned. And so he could have carried on practicing as a doctor in theory. But he was put up before the General Medical Council's tribunal for malpractice. And he was handed a five month suspension. And that five month suspension was really widely decried as inadequate, almost insultingly inadequate, and it was appealed to the High Court. And the High Court said, that is absolutely insultingly inadequate, just a slap on the wrist, indeed, Rona. And the High Court sent it back for a redecision, um, strongly implying that the redecision would have to be striking him off, which means permanently barring him from practicing medicine in the UK. We yet to see what the final result of that will be. But what got me interested was actually the three criteria that the court uses to decide whether or not a sanction against any medical professional, doctor, dentist, paramedic, whoever, is adequate. And these are the three criteria. Protecting the health, safety and well-being of the public, maintaining public confidence in the profession and maintaining proper professional standards and conduct for members of that profession. And we can easily see in a case like Simon Brammel, why those three criteria were not met by anything short of striking him off. Protecting health and safety, obviously doing unnecessary non-consensual operations on people is not just wrong, but it's also dangerous. Larking about in the operating theatre endangers people, and indeed making a climate in the operating theatre where the nurses don't feel able to report you because they clearly didn't feel able to report him endangers patient safety as well. Public confidence is also really important. If the public gets the impression that doctors can get away with that sort of thing, 
they're not going to have confidence in the medical profession and they might even feel reluctant to go ahead with operations themselves because they'll think what if my doctor puts his initials on my liver and the final one maintaining proper professional standards i think is essentially just about the idea that there are some people who shouldn't be doctors there are some people who behave in a way that doctors should not behave and even if that behavior doesn't affect anyone's safety and even if that behavior is kept secret enough that it doesn't affect confidence in the profession it's just wrong Interestingly, though, these three criteria also find some sort of root in the Jewish tradition as well in relation to rabbis. And it's a sad fact that rabbis can also endanger all of these things. Rabbi, ca rabbis can harm people's health, safety and well-being. Rabbis can harm public confidence in the, in the rabbinate and also in Judaism and also in God, indeed. And finally, of course, there are just basic standards and ethics of the rabbinic profession, if we're going to call it a profession that it's necessary to meet. So where do we find a Jewish basis for these principles? Protecting people's health, safety and well-being is actually relatively easy to find principles for. So in the Torah, we have three different um, halakhot, which I think are really relevant to this. The first one is the idea of the shor muad, of the ox that the owner knows is dangerous. So in other words, if you own a dangerous um, creature, facility, you have a responsibility to make sure that it doesn't hurt other people. And that can certainly apply to the rabbinate. If it knows that it has people within its ranks who are a danger, who are abusive, it has to do something about it. The second one of these principles is lifne eva, putting a stumbling block before the blind and allowing someone to practice as a rabbi when you know that they're abusive or dangerous and congregants might not know that they're abusive or dangerous is a real problem. But so too can it be a real problem that a rabbi who does things in a slightly dodgy way, a rabbi who will do a conversion that's not going to be recognized, a rabbi who will tell you that something's the case when it's actually not the case, that can lead to real life difficulties for people who've been misled about their status. And the final principle is the ma'aka, which is the parapet. You shall build a parapet around your roof. And this is again the idea that if you're creating a dangerous situation, then you have a responsibility to make a parapet to ensure that there's some sort of system to limit the amount of danger that can happen. I can see wonderful comments happening in the chat about exactly what a rabbi is, which is really important, and we're going to come on to it. Thank you all so much. The second principle is about maintaining public confidence. And this is where we have this rather long line here. This comes from a commentary by the Ritva, who is an Italian um, commentator from the Middle Ages um, on a passage of Talmud. And he's referring to a case where a student rabbi was accused of being a wrong'un. I have no experience of being a student rabbi accused of being a wrong'un, but I gather it does happen. And the Ritva's comment is that to cover up over the wrongdoing of wrongdoers would lead people to say that the rabbis are flattering each other. And I think that's a really powerful idea that he's come up with. The idea of the rabbis flattering each other, the idea that it's just an old boys club, the idea that rabbis don't police each other because they don't really mind. That's what really harms public confidence. And we only need to look at the sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic Church to see exactly how damaging that can be. Yes, as Michael has said, the rabbinate in Israel has a very low approval rating of any public institution. Interestingly, and unusually for me, I am going to say some nice things about the rabbinate in Israel in a little bit as well. Um, but absolutely, the reputation of the profession is really bound up in the way that it treats wrongdoers. And finally, this idea of proper professional standards. This is from the Talmud itself, again, from the discussion of the um, Talmud Chacham, of the rabbinic student who was a wrongan, where Rav Yehuda said not to excommunicate him would be a chilul Hashem, would desecrate um, the divine name. And again, I think that's a really powerful idea. The idea that there are some people who allowing them to be part of the rabbinate is a chilul Hashem. And this, I think, goes slightly further than the medical example, because in the medical professions, it's kind of a two way relationship. You've got the public and you've got the doctor. In Judaism with the rabbis, I think we possibly have a three way relationship. We have the rabbi, the congregant, but also we've got God is part of that, is the other corner of the triangle as well. And rabbi's misconduct has the potential to affect both other parties in that relationship. So the big question is, where does this leave us with rabbis? Now, what I am not doing in my dissertation is looking at 
when a rabbi should be defrocked and what are the boundaries of rabbinic misconduct? That's a very big question and it's a very different question. The person I'm taking as my paradigm example of why there must be a need to defrock is this man here who we can see on screen called Fred Neulander. Fred Neulander was the rabbi of a synagogue in New Jersey, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And one day a congregant offered to make a $20,000 donation to enable the synagogue to buy a new Sefer Torah. And the rabbi said, thank you very much. And he spent 2000 pounds buying a facsimile Sefer Torah, one which was not kosher for use. And the rest of the money he used to induce a mentally ill congregant to kill his wife, to kill the rabbi's wife. And the rabbi wanted his wife killed so that the rabbi could begin a relationship with a different congregant who he had been sexually pursuing. And this different congregant was someone with whom he began an adulterous relationship when he um, buried her husband. So she was in a very vulnerable place. He was providing bereavement support to her. She wasn't Jewish. She fast tracked her conversion um, in order to make sure that she was um, available to him. And then he had his wife killed. As Rabbi Barbara says, horrible, awful situation. But the shocking thing is that Fred Neulander is not only still a rabbi, but he's still insisting on being called rabbi. So he's serving a life sentence in New Jersey, but whenever he's interviewed by journalists, um, which happens fairly often because it's a fairly astonishing case, he still asks them to call him rabbi. He still has some sort of chaplaincy related privilege in the prison um, because he's a rabbi and there's no facility um, in the American reform rabbinate for rabbis to have their title revoked. And I'm using him as kind of the classic, maybe extreme, I mean, definitely extreme, as the classic example of why there needs to be a facility to do something about people like this. Now, we might say he's serving a life sentence, so it doesn't matter that much whether he's a rabbi or not. And I think it really does matter. First of all, because of the public confidence issue, partly because he only just got sent to prison um, because he um, was only convicted on a retrial. On the first trial, he was not, he, he, went, he went free. Um, and so this is what got me interested in the question. David Benkoff has asked a really interesting question, which is there's no way to stop someone from calling themselves a rabbi. We're going to come on to that. The answer is yes and no. Um, Mishi has asked, was he a member of a rabbinical organization? Yes, he was a member of the CCAR, which is the Reform Rabbinical Organization. He was expelled from them. If you go on the CCR website, they've got a list of rabbis who were expelled and um, a brief summary of why. His brief summary of why he was expelled is for breaching the rules on family relationships, which I think is maybe quite a generous way of um, describing that situation. However, something interesting has happened because whenever I've spoken to my teachers and to rabbis about my dissertation topic, I've always got one of two different responses. First of all, I got defrocking rabbis, you're tempting fate there, Gabriel, ha ha ha. The more seriously I got defrocking rabbis, that's not a thing. Once a rabbi, always a rabbi. Really quite a lot of people use this phrase, once a rabbi, always a rabbi. But what's intriguing is that whenever I spoke to people who weren't rabbis, and I've spoken to quite a lot of people in different um, professions, I've spoken to lawyers, I've spoken to the doctors. When I've spoken to them about defrocking rabbis, I've had two different um, responses. I had defrocking rabbis, you're tempting fate there, Gabriel, ha ha ha. But I also had, but of course rabbis can be banned, can't they? Like in every other job. There's this real disconnect between what rabbis think can happen and what lay people assume can happen or must happen or should be able to happen. And interestingly enough, this is a case when it is the non-rabbis who are right, because throughout my research, I've managed to uncover 17 cases in which rabbis have had their titles revoked. And they have been for quite a wide variety of things. We can see some of these examples coming up here. I've roughly tried to color code them into different categories. And so that green one, uncollegiality, there were quite a lot of rabbis, particularly in sort of 15th, 16th century Italy, who were revoking each other's smicha for uncollegiality, for disagreeing with their teachers, for opening a synagogue in a town where there was already a synagogue, for that sort of thing. The yellow items, um, issuing invalid gitin and giving excessively lenient rulings, seem to be almost about incompetence. Um, seem to be about the idea of a rabbi who is just not able to be a rabbi, not so much about misconduct per se. 
the orange category are very much um, doctrinal um, issues. Some of these we might think are not appropriate reasons to revoke someone's rabbinate. So obviously, I think working in a progressive reason, working in a progressive synagogue is not a valid reason for revoking someone's title. Waxing hair, I think, you know, it's pretty bad, but, you know, maybe some sort of suspension or something is, is maybe more justified. Moonlighting as a Catholic priest. I'm just briefly going to divert onto this man's story because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, this is a man called Yehuda Tillinger, who uh, became a rabbi in Europe. He was born in the Ukraine and he um, had a brief spell as a Christian, not so far as I can tell as a priest, but as a Christian in his youth. And unfortunately, that brief spell as a Christian led to him being tarred as having been a priest and being a particularly evil apostate and having been someone who was um, involved in giving evidence in blood libel trials. I've looked really hard and a couple of proper professors of blood libel trials, there are such a thing as professors of blood libel trials, have looked really hard and can't actually find any evidence that he did any of these wrong things. And it seems to have been some level of moral panic. But nonetheless, that's what he was accused of. He moved to the States to try and start a new life. He worked as a rabbi in the Bronx. He was unmasked when someone from the old country recognized him in a kosher deli. Um, and he um, was defrocked by a committee of rabbis in New York. And he was not able to clear his name. And he ultimately lived out the remainder of his life in, in poverty in a shack outside Rio de Janeiro. I think it's a very sad case because I don't actually think he did it. But of course, as a principle, moonlighting as a Catholic priest would be reason to defrock someone. It just so happens that I'm not convinced by the evidence in his case. The last two are this pink group at the top. And this is where I'm going to say something unusually nice about Rabbanut, about the Israeli Rabbanut. These are both modern cases. These are both from the last 10 years. And these are both rabbis who have had their title revoked by the Rabbanut, by the Israeli chief Rabbanut, for what we would actually recognize as misconduct. The one who stole Sifrei Torah, he was stealing Torah scrolls from his own synagogue. He was convicted of theft, and the rabbinate said anyone who gets convicted of theft, if they're a rabbi, they're going to have their title reviewed. Slightly unfortunately, the chief rabbi at the time, Yonah Metzger, was the next year convicted of bribery and fraud, and he did have his title reviewed. Um, but strangely enough, he is still a rabbi. I don't know quite how that happened. Um, but the sexual harassment case, this person was not convicted. They were actually specifically not convicted. The police decided there was no case to answer. But nonetheless, Rabbi Nutt said it's sufficiently serious that they shouldn't continue to be a rabbi even if they could continue to be a free person. And I think that's a really positive step for Rabbanut to have taken, recognizing that there is a higher standard that needs to apply to the Rabbanut and that the criminal process and the professional process are different. However, as some of you have been mentioning in um, the chat, they've also been things rabbis have done wrong for which they have not been defrocked. Here are some examples of things rabbis have done wrong for which they haven't been defrocked. We've got the murder. Um, there have been quite a lot of instances of um, like rape and various sorts of sexual assault, mikvah peeping, anti-Arab racism, becoming a Jew for Jesus. A graduate of Leobet College um, went to Australia and then found Jesus there and became a messianic rabbi um, in Melbourne. And there was a conversation in Leobet College at the time. This was in the 90s about whether or not he could have his title revoked. And the conclusion was that he couldn't. Once a rabbi, always a rabbi. And so he continued to work as a rabbi. Ben, you're making a really good point that I'm going to come on to in just a second. Well done. Um, but these are things which I think we should seriously think about at the very least, um, suggesting that um, defrocking should be an option. The question is, can it be done? And that comes down to the basic question, which is more or less the one that Ben raised, which is, what is smicha? What is being a rabbi? And there's kind of a lot of answers to this. And one of my teachers put it um, quite well, which was saying, um, smicha doesn't really exist anymore. And how can you take away something that doesn't exist? And the answer is, I think it does exist, but it exists slightly differently. So Dane has just asked, who was the rabbi who became a Jew for Jesus? His name was Harold Valins, V-A-L-L-I-N-S. Most of the sources about him are on Messianic websites, surprisingly enough, but um, he definitely existed. Smicha historically was something very specific. So in the tradition, there's an unbroken chain of smicha from biblical times up until around the time of the um around the time of Hillel around the fourth century some say it goes slightly further with, sorry not around the time of Hillel until around the fourth century through the time of Hillel to the fourth century but then it broke off and what we would call smicha these days is 
kind of an imitation smicha. It's something we call smicha that's not the historical smicha. So when I become a rabbi, I won't be the same sort of rabbi as Rabbi Hillel was. I will be someone who's got a modern smicha. And what is modern smicha? Well, I think there's two different ways we could look at it. We could look at it as an educational qualification, much like having an academic degree. So at the very beginning, when I was talking about Simon Brammel, I saw someone put in the chat that he lost his um, he lost his ability to practice medicine, but he didn't lose his degree. And that's absolutely true. He's still got a medical degree. He's just not allowed to practice medicine. And we could say similarly with Smicha that what I will be receiving next year certifies that I've completed five years of study and that I should only be losing it if it turns out that I plagiarized my essays or I lied in my application form or something retrospective. And that would certainly suggest, if we're comparing it to university degrees, that it shouldn't be irrevocable for anything that happens after it's rewarded. But there is another school of thought. And the other school of thought is that it's not so much an academic qualification as a license. I think that's a license to kill if you look closely at it, which is a little bit unfortunate in the circumstances, I realise. But um, we could look at it more as a license to practice. And we actually get some particular support for this idea from doctors. So halakhically, doctors are regulated um, with a rule that they're only immune from being sued if they're registered with the Betdin. So traditionally, and according to the earliest texts, anyone is allowed to practice as a doctor. There's no qualification required, anything like that. But if you do something wrong, you're going to get sued and you're going to be in trouble. But if you register with the Bet Din, who had some sort of minimum standards, then you would be immune from that. But later halakhic texts take that slightly further. And the Arucha Shulchan in particular has two rules. The first is that you have to register. So you can't be an unregistered doctor anymore, according to the Arucha Shulchan. But the second one is that the license you are given is called smicha. And the Arucha Shulchan, which is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, specifically refers to doctors as having a smicha, as having a medical smicha. And I think that's a really useful model. The idea that smicha is not just a certificate that you've got certain qualifications, but that is actually a license, an ongoing suitability for you to practice your profession, is really powerful. And the main reason it's really powerful is that it reflects our general understanding of what a rabbi is. Congregants, at any rate, when they hear that someone's called a rabbi, they don't think, well, they once passed some qualification five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. They think, this is a trustworthy person who I'll be alone in a room with. I'll let my 12 year old daughter be in alone in a room with. I'll confess my deepest problems to. There's at least an understanding from congregants that a rabbi is a trustworthy person and not just someone who passed an exam in their, um, I was gonna say in their youth, I'm not, well, that's pushing it a bit, who passed an exam in history. And so I'm running with this idea of smicha as license that I'm borrowing from the idea of medical smicha in the Arucha Shulchan. And I think it works partly because there's a halachic basis for it and partly because it just reflects the reality that we're living in, rightly or wrongly. The question then is, how could we actually revoke smicha within a halakhic framework or without a halakhic framework? Now, um, the reason why I'm looking at both of these options, as a progressive Jew, my instinct was just to say, we need to do it, let's do it, who needs the halakha? But actually I realized three different things. First of all, if the halakha can help us to get where we want to go, let's use it. I think that's a really good thing for us to be doing as progressive Jews. We don't need to turn our back on halakha unnecessarily. And those of you who are not progressive Jews definitely won't want to turn your back on halakha unnecessarily. The second reason is that even progressive rabbis are called rabbis. We decided to use people called rabbis rather than calling them any other names. And so we've at least bought into that area of halakha. And so I think it behoves us to look more at the whole, the whole of it. And the final reason is a very pragmatic reason, which is that defrocking a rabbi is more likely to be legally watertight if there's a Jewish basis for it, rather than if it's just some process that was invented in 2021. The courts are much more reluctant to overturn religious bodies' decisions that are doctrinal in nature, or ecclesiastical as the word is, rather than anything else. And so I've got a number of different options for how the halakha could allow for the defrocking of a wayward rabbi. Beginning with conditional smicha. And this is one that is actually widely used. Um, and a number of the cases that I referred to where rabbis have had their smicha revoked was based on conditions. So 
Jews College, as was, um, and Yeshiva University, both include conditions in their smicha saying, this smicha will be revoked if you do so-and-so. And the so-and-so is normally things like allowing mixed seating in your synagogue or allowing an organ in your synagogue or whatever it might be. But of course, that seems fairly watertight as an option, because if the condition's there, it works. The problem is that it only works prospectively. And for those rabbis who don't have a condition written into their smicha, which I won't unless my dissertation is very, very persuasive and changes the entire rabbinate before July, then there's going to be no option available. And I think it's probably unnecessary because in most of the cases, most of those 17 historical cases, we didn't rely on a condition. So there must be some other halakhic route. The second option, which seems to possibly have been used in some of the historical cases, is selective excommunication or selective cherem, so to speak. And that would mean putting someone under a cherem, but a very limited, limited cherem, because the rules on cherem actually allow the precise restrictions that it imposes to be really carefully tailored. The classic cherem that we will think about when we think of cherem and Spinoza is very, very wide, but it doesn't need to be that wide. And it is actually halakhically possible for a bet din to place someone under a cherem that only limits them to not calling themselves rabbi and not working as a rabbi. The problem with that is I just don't really like the idea of cherem. And it's not really something that modern Jewish communities are going to buy into. And we've all seen it being abused, particularly being abused to marginalized progressive Jews, indeed, historically. A third option, which a couple of the historical cases used again, is probably the most unattractive of all of them, which is excommunicating other people sort of preemptively. And so some of these decisions um, from particularly sort of 16th, 17th century said anyone who calls so and so a rabbi will themselves be excommunicated. And so this is kind of the inverse of the previous one, but it's much less attractive even than that. The idea that other people who've done nothing wrong are going to be excommunicated. Um, just doesn't really sit that well. I'm listing it because it's one of the things that happened, but there we go. Option four, which I think is probably one of the best one, relies on a passage from the Shulchan Aruch, which is hopefully displaying on screen now. Yes, it is. Which says, a Talmud Chacham HaMazalzel but mitzvot, a um, Talmud Chacham, a sage who Mazalzel is like disrespects or a, um, abuses, makes light of the mitzvot, and who does not have about them the fear of heaven, behold, they are as lowly as a layperson. Now, the language of being as lowly as a layperson isn't particularly attractive, um, because we don't consider that lay people are lowlier than rabbis. But the idea that actually someone can go from being a wise person to being a layperson, from being a rabbi to being a non-rabbi, is exactly what we're trying to achieve here. And I think this is actually a really powerful line. And this is actually mirroring the um, Catholic terminology for defrocking, which is laicization, making someone into a lay person again. And I think there are circumstances where this could be a really powerful tool. The final option, though, is about making up a new process. And as I said, that is an option, particularly for progressive Jews. But even so, even if we were going to use one of these previous processes, for example, if we were going to go with option four, we can combine new elements into how it works. And I think there are a few um, elements of particularly secular processes that could be very usefully combined into any defrocking process in the modern rabbinate. The first one is about publicized outcomes and reasoned decisions. And they go hand in hand. If you go on the Church of England website, there is a page where they've got all of the decisions of their clergy discipline tribunal. And you can read them in really great detail and quite harrowing detail sometimes. But I think that's really important. And I think that that harrowing detail is there to show that the church is not afraid to confront the detail of what people did. The thing where the Central Conference of American Rabbis refers to Fred Neulander as breaching the rule on family relationships looks a little bit like they are afraid to confront what he did. I'm not saying they are, but it gives the impression to the public that it looks like they're afraid to confront what he did. And actually providing clear details on what has gone wrong, I think is absolutely vital. And more than that, we find some basis in the Jewish tradition for that. 
Um, the Mishpate Uziel, which is a set of responses written by the last chief rabbi of mandatory Palestine and the first chief rabbi of the new state of Israel, suggests that it's really important for Bate Din to borrow secular ideas, borrow ideas from the secular legal process, if they're good ideas, to um, make the process more fair and more realistic. And he particularly refers to reasoned decisions. The second idea is including lay people on the Bet Din. And I think this is really important, partly because it enhances public confidence and it dispels that idea of the old boys club and rabbis just looking after each other. But also because rabbis aren't experts in everything. And a lot of the sorts of wrongdoing we're talking about these days are particularly going to relate to psychological abuse, sexual abuse, um, like grooming, uh, you know, different sorts of areas that secular wisdom is really, really important that the rabbis simply are not trained in. Even financial abuse, there might be times when, you know, an accountant or someone who can go through a congregant's accounts and understand exactly what has gone wrong is available. And that idea of bringing in secular expertise is, again, really important. And the final one is the idea of um, having unduly lenient rulings being appealable. And this is something that, again, I spoke about at the very beginning with the medical profession, which is it's easy to make a mistake and it's easy to think that someone did something less serious than they actually did. And there needs to be a process whereby decisions aren't final. And there's at least one opportunity for review. Otherwise, you risk public confidence being harmed irreparably. And that's not something that we want. And so where am I going with all this? First of all, I'm going to try to condense all of these ideas that I've been talking about into some proposed amendments to the liberal reform rabbi's ethics process, which was introduced last year, hasn't been put into force yet because it's still being set up. I'm not necessarily intending that it will actually happen because I am very, very lowly compared to my wonderful teachers in the rabbinate at the moment. But I'm going to try and draft it in the format of um, amendments because I think that really concentrates what the idea is going to be. I also need to think about people who are former members. So people who I think someone mentioned in the chat advertise themselves as an independent rabbi or are not part of a professional body or are freelance or who resign rather than face any sort of disciplinary process. That's really troublesome as well, because they're they're even more free to do bad things than rabbis who are at least employed in a synagogue where there might be some sort of structure around them. And that, I think, needs a lot more thought. And the final point is I want to keep scouring for more cases, because when I found 15 rabbis who'd been defrocked in history, I thought that must be it now. I've spent ages doing this. My wife's bored, sick of hearing about all these different responses I've been finding. And then I found a 16. And then I thought, well, that must be it now. And then I found a 17th. And I think it's overwhelmingly likely there are at least some more out there. If anyone has any leads, I would love to hear them. Um, but those are the tasks that are coming next to my dissertation. And I see there's been some fascinating chat in the chat, which is exactly where I hope it would be. I'm really happy to take questions now. I'm going to unshare my screen just so I can see you all slightly more clearly. I've got no idea how to unshare my screen. There we go. I've done it. I'm going to look in the Q&A because I think there are some questions posted there. And do please continue um, adding questions as we go there as well. So I've got, should there be a maximum term for rabbis as we have for the chief rabbi? It's a really interesting question. I don't, I don't know quite how that would work in practice, because again, with a rabbi, you've got different things. You've got the title and you've got the job. And some rabbis change jobs very frequently. Some rabbis hold the same job for a very long time. Some rabbis take a break from being a rabbi and will practice as a counselor or something like that for a little bit and then return to the rabbinate. Um, but certainly linked to Sarah's question above, is there a case for some kind of ongoing stamp of approval? Some sort of sort of in-service training or um, what's it called? CPD, continuing professional development, is really important. And I know in the States, reform rabbis do have something like that. It maybe used to be the case in the UK, but we're a much smaller rabbinate, so it's much more difficult. David has asked, should we be inviting defrocked rabbis to Shabbos dinners, making shidduchim for them, or should they essentially be in harem? My instinct is that once someone's been defrocked as a rabbi, then they're just like a lay person who did whatever it was that they did, is my instinct. And how we should treat a lay person who's done bad things is a really, really complicated question. And I'm pleased to be able to use the get out clause of saying it's beyond the scope of my research. But I'm really keen to understand this process to be very much about the profession. So in the same way, a struck off doctor we don't treat them as some sort of pariah in society necessarily. It would depend more on what they did. Um, I'm thinking maybe something similar to that. 
Um, Robin has asked how serious do I think a breach of ethics or criminality should be? Um, should adultery lead to defrocking? I think there's different sorts of adultery. Um, I think sort of plain adultery where it's completely consensual and it doesn't take place on the bimmer and there's sort of no particular aggravating factors, maybe it shouldn't. But again, I think this is not necessarily a new question. So all of the medical bodies have guidelines on their websites for their tribunals about when striking off is appropriate and when a lesser sanction is appropriate. And most of those can actually be read across. And I think it's mainly sexual abuse where defrocking is going to be the available, is going to be the only appropriate option. But there are, you know, people will think of ways of wrongdoing that I've not even thought of. Hiring a congregant to kill your wife, I don't think anyone ever thought of until Fred Neulander did it. Um, my professional development teacher, Rabbi Richards, has asked, what would be the role for the seminary or college that awarded the smicha? That's a really interesting one. Um, so Hebrew Union College in the States um, recently had its own abuse scandal and there was a recommendation by independent investigators that it should be HUC, it should be the college that supervises the defrocking process. I'm not, I'm instinctively not so keen on that because I think actually colleges are very good at teaching rabbis and are very good at selecting people to begin training as rabbis. That experience of practicing in the rabbinate and knowing what the boundaries are in the practicing rabbinate is something that actually the professional bodies are maybe more expert in. Um, in Leobeck, there's lots of people who are part-time practicing rabbis and part-time academics, but I think actually it's, it seems like a professional body thing that um, should be there. Dina has asked a wonderful question. Isn't there an alternative term to defrocking? The answer is not really. And I've kind of reluctantly used the word defrocking because it's the main English word that we use for this. And also it's the word that the CCAR uses, that the American Reform Movement uses for rabbis in the context of we don't defrock rabbis. Um, in Hebrew, the term hasarat ha'atara is the one that is quite often used, which means removing the crown. Um, and that's a reference to a verse in Ezekiel saying, take the crown off his head, which is the um, suggestion that that's what's happening to a rabbi who's defrocked. I quite like it as a Hebrew term, but in simple English and as a verb particularly, I've not managed to find anything um, alternative to defrocking. Linda has asked, can't these um, sex offenders still find a job elsewhere in a small desperate shawl? And that also goes back to David's question at the very beginning. Can you stop someone calling themselves rabbi? And I think the answer to an extent is yes, someone who's absolutely determined to evade the rules will be able to evade the rules. But that's also a case, of course, with doctors were struck off, lawyers were struck off. Anyone is able to lie about their qualifications to some extent. I don't think that's necessarily a reason not to do it. And we also need to look at what would happen, for example, if someone lost their undergraduate degree. If Sussex University found out that I plagiarised my undergraduate dissertation, I'd lose my undergraduate degree. But what are they going to do about that? Like, I've still got my degree certificate. I can still put the letters BA after my name. I don't think unenforceability is necessarily the same as the question of whether it can, in fact, be removed. And also, of course, particularly with something that has a victim like sexual abuse, there's the idea of catharsis to the victim as well and sending out a really important message that we will not tolerate this person and we will go to the absolute utmost of our powers to prevent them from doing harm again. And if the utmost of our powers is not enough, so be it. But we want to symbolise that we're doing absolutely everything we can. Jonathan has asked, under whose jurisdiction would a rabbi whose smicha was awarded in one country and serving in a shul in another country? As far as I'm aware, almost every almost every country has some sort of professional body for the rabbinate. It might be a professional body for that country, or it might be a you know like a, a Europe-wide professional body for the smaller jurisdictions, or so on. Um, but yeah, that's that's a really complicated question. And again, I'm lucky enough to be able to be writing about it in a UK context where we've got very clear structures. Ezra, Ezra has asked about teshuva process, which I think is really important. I think I'm specifically thinking about defrocking in a context where teshuva is not a practical option. And I think Fred Neulander is kind of a classic case of someone for whom, even if he made teshuva, and he certainly always claims his innocence, which suggests he won't do it, even if he made teshuva, he cannot be allowed to return to the rabbinate. It's just that bridge has burnt for him. And I think that's very different to rabbis who are suspended or expelled, where there is a particular teshuva process. And it's very clearly laid out in most rabbinic organizations, codes of conduct, how that teshuva process works and the timescales and whether they need counseling and what sort of supervision they need. But I think there are certain circumstances where someone simply cannot be allowed to be a rabbi again. And I think in those circumstances, it probably should be immutable. 
Um, Isaac has asked, is the medical procedure something we could directly transfer to a rabbinic context? Sad, sadly not, um, partly because it's strangely silent on the revoking, on the revocation of, the, of that permission of that smicha. Um, one assumes it can happen because like reshut is the, is the other word that's used for it and we assume that it can be revoked, but um, it's, not, it's not detailed how it works, so it's not directly readable across. Annabelle has asked more about the ethics process I mentioned. Yes, of course. So the liberal and reform movements in this country have got um, a joint now ethics process. So for all the liberal and reform rabbis together, it was introduced about last year. A website is being set up, which will have copies of it all and a reporting procedure and so on. If you want to read it in the meantime, it's very, very similar to the American reform ethics process. Um, largely borrowed from, indeed, um, which is the Central Conference of American Rabbis Ethics Process, you can view online. Um, can the rabbinical bodies come out with better guidelines of expectations, Sarah has asked. Yes, is the answer. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And even the ethics, pro ethics processes that there are at the moment are not even that clear. Like some of them only, you know, in the sexual, uh, in the sexual conduct section only say so far as don't commit sexual misconduct, really. And it's really difficult to put in writing all the different possible range of situations. And just like Robin mentioned adultery, where do you draw that line? You know, what are we, there's different sorts of adultery, there's different sorts of sexual misconduct, but I think there's much more that can be done to make those boundaries absolutely clear. Um, I'm just gonna take a peep in the chat as well, because some things have been happening there as well. It's likely, yeah, Nat has made a very good point. It's, likely that defrocking would make a huge splash. Um, and historically, that certainly is what happened. And a number of the response about um, defrocking have specifically said, I'm going to publish in the newspapers that I'm defrocking you. My favourite one was actually a response from the Mahari Vail, who said, um, it had occurred to me to defrock this person myself, but actually I don't want to give him the credit of being defrocked by such a great man as me to defrock such a low life like him. It does use the Hebrew word for low life. And so instead, I'm going to ask one of my pupils to defrock him, which is you know, that's proper Hamish. That's a, that's a proper way to insult. You're so bad, I wouldn't even defrock you. Um, Clara said, I'm amazed that the number of defrocked rabbis is so low. Absolutely. And I think particularly the fact that throughout the whole total of Jewish history, one rabbi has been defrocked for sexual abuse is shocking. Like there have been way more than one rabbi who's committed serious sexual abuse. Um, Linda has suggested that smicha be replaced by a new word. It's really, it's a really interesting idea and I don't entirely disagree. It's just that I fear that ship might have sailed, um, for better or for worse. But I'm not sure I do agree that it's just akin to PhD because again, people assume that a rabbi is somewhat a trustworthy, is somewhat a trustworthy person. And I think we need to live a little bit in the world as it is rather than the world as it should be. And congregants assume that the person that the council of their synagogue has appointed to be rabbi is a suitable person to do that job, not just has the educational background to do it, but is a suitable person to do the job. And they might be halakhically wrong to have that assumption, but I think they do have that assumption. And that's maybe when we come back to the idea of the ox, the forewarned ox, where people might assume that the ox is safe if someone keeps it out in the field. But if you know that it's not safe, or if you know that people are going to be under that misapprehension, then you maybe have a duty to do something about it. David has asked, how could I possibly handle this massive task when you have to be familiar with every source and kind of source in Judaica? Yeah, I mean, it's not. It's not possible. And I'm absolutely certain that the minute I submit my dissertation, I will stumble over something else or find something else or read another footnote. Um, you know, first of all, that's what the PhD is for. But more to the point, um, you know, that's that's life. That's learning. And um, I think you can say that about almost any topic that we're having at Limud is whoever's giving a talk. There's always going to be undiscovered material, some of which people are pointing out to me as we speak and some of which will maybe remain undiscovered. Like Yehuda Tillinger, the rabbi with the. Um, who was not moonlighting as a Catholic priest, I discovered him. He had been completely forgotten to history until I happened to find him in a footnote in the Jewish Telegraph Agency archives. And. Like it felt really weird to be resurrecting someone completely forgotten, but that's the one that's the wonderful thing about history, particularly Jewish history, is you find fascinating people. I think we've got about five minutes left if there's anything else. You're all coming up with really fascinating questions. Now I hope I'm gonna be able to save this somehow because these are different ideas as well. Was the one who was trucked for sexual abuse Moti Alon? I believe it was. That's certainly a name that sounds familiar, Jessica.
Irene has asked, how can anyone be a rabbi if they don't live by the Jewish values they teach others? Like that's that's an interesting one. And I think that's actually slightly more complicated because rabbis are also human beings. And I think the boundary between defrocking and um, just someone not necessarily being a great rabbi is a really wide one and a really important one. And just because a rabbi might occasionally um, do something that's slightly wrong doesn't necessarily mean they're completely unfit. Like my confession is going to be at the very start of the pandemic, um, when I was just beginning to get used to Zoom, I was leading a service and I was displaying the Siddur on the screen as I was going. And then I got to my sermon and I was so bored while I was giving my own sermon that I checked an email during it and I didn't realise that that was displayed on screen. And like, that was wrong of me. I shouldn't have been distracted during a service. I shouldn't have been using personal email during a service. Should that mean that I'm never allowed to be a rabbi just because I did something a bit hypocritical and a bit wrong? I don't think it probably should. That's something that I learned I learned my lesson from. Um, I am going to pop my email in the chat because it's just been asked for. Um, Chava has asked about maybe people want to be a rabbi because of the sense of power and respect. This is really interesting. And Rabbi Stephen Pierce has written a fascinating psychological study of rabbinic abuse um, and the idea of why it is that clergy abuse is such a thing. And he suggests it's partly bad apples. It's partly the wrong people going into the rabbinate for the wrong reasons. But actually, he comes up with a lot of reasons as to why the particular dynamics of working as a rabbi can lead to psychological temptation and risk. And he's not doing that in the sense of defending people who do this stuff at all, but rather in the sense of mitigating risk and the sorts of things that rabbis need to be aware of. And some of those are issues that are well known in other professions. So counsellors and therapists will be well familiar with the ideas of transference and counter-transference, which can also happen to rabbis. But also, I'm told that it's really difficult to envisage being a rabbi in a community um, until you're there. And the isolation that that can bring if you're going to be the sole rabbi in a community and the idea that there's not really anyone you can connect with in quite the same way. You can't be friends with your congregants in the same way you can be friends with your friends. And that's a sort of situation that can lead to illicit relationships um, as well. And so looking at that context is really important. Um, Rabbi Barbara has asked the really important question, how many women rabbis have been de-whatevered? The answer is none have been de-whatevered. Moreover, in all my researches, I found quite a lot of names of rabbis who've been subject to ethics processes. None of them at all were women. That doesn't mean that there weren't any women among the ethics processes because most of them are confidential. But surprise, surprise, um, none of them were women. Absolutely, the solution is more women in the rabbinate. And I think it's not at all a coincidence um, that the majority of the wrongdoers were men at all. Um, does a rabbi not have an automatic license to sit on a bet din to judge others, says Rolfe. Um, It depends very much on the modern context. I'm not sure that um, progressive rabbis would necessarily treat our bet din as judging others. All our bet din supervises is conversions, which is judging others in a sense, but not necessarily in the full bet din sense. But my mum says it was an excellent session, so I'm glad I did it now. Um, but you're absolutely right. This The position of responsibility and power that people have... Um, is what is important and particularly on a bet din context supervising conversions and so a number of rabbis whose smicha or whose conduct has been called into question people who converted under bat -e din on which they sat have had their conversions called into question and in particular a lot of fred neulander's converts have had their conversions called into question and i think that's really unfortunate and i think that's really unfair in a lot of ways as well because just because a rabbi is a bad person doesn't mean that the people they converted are unsuitable but then again, Harold Valens, the messianic rabbi in Australia, also did conversions. And actually, maybe a close look does need to be done at the people who he converted, because he was not just a bad person. I mean, he might not have been a bad person, but he was doctrinally wacko, if you'll allow me to use the phrase. And supervising conversions on a bet din is a doctrinal function. And so maybe there is room to look at that. And that's really what I mean about the um, stumbling, block, stumbling block before the blind issue, which is bad rabbis don't just hurt people directly but they can mislead people a long way so that years later people will find out that their Jewish status isn't recognized or that they can't get married in Israel or whatever it might be like that. Just going back to the Q and A as more are pouring in. Is there a process to rehabilitate the reputation of a defrocked rabbi who turned out to be innocent? That's a fascinating question. Um, I mean, the answer, the, look, I mean, the instinctive answer is no, because there's not even a process to defrock at the moment. I'm in the pro, I'm, I'm in the process of um, trying to innovate it. I guess as a matter of principle, there must be a way to undo a decision that was actually um, based on wrong facts rather than anything else. 
like if DNA evidence subsequently proved that a rabbi hadn't done something, should they get their title back? I'm sure they should. I think that that only that only seems just. That's a really interesting idea. I've not thought of. Thank you for that. There you go. Save the chat. I have to cut. Very good. So I think we've got a couple of more minutes if anyone has got anything else. Um, otherwise, I'm really grateful to you all for filling filling up my head with important and interesting ideas. Um, good luck with your rabbinate, says Rabbi Rachel. That's a bit that's a big one, but I appreciate it as well. Will I go by rabbi and doctor? Well, at the moment, I'm only at the master stage, but I'm being repeatedly told by my teachers that I need to turn um, my, the my master's thesis into a PhD eventually. And hopefully then um, I might get some rest. But there we go. Thank you all so much for joining. It has been lovely to speak to you and see your comments. Um, do please email me if you'd like any more information. Lovely to see you all. Enjoy the rest of Limud.